Let's turn to our sermon text this morning as we continue our way through uh, Genesis, this uh, opening book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 24. And you'll notice there, it's uh, one of the more lengthy chapters, so I'm going to just read a few sections here. I uh, encourage you to read the whole uh, on, uh, or maybe later on, uh, to kind of refresh your memory, but it's 67 verses. I'll read uh, uh, at least to begin with here, uh, down through verse 28. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had, Put your hand under my thigh, that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell, but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, Perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? Abraham said to him, See to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and who spoke to me and swore to me, To your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed, taking all sorts of choice gifts from his master. And he rose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. And he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of evening, the time when women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young woman to whom I shall say, Please let down your jar that I may drink. And who shall say, Drink, and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. Before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her jar, a water jar on her shoulder. The young woman was very attractive in appearance, a maiden whom no man had known. She went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please give me a little drink a little water to drink from your jar. She said, Drink, my lord. And she quickly let down her jar upon her hand and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water. And she drew for all his camels. The man gazed at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring weighing a half shekel and two bracelets for her arms, weighing ten gold shekels, and said, Please tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. She added, We have plenty of both straw and fodder and room to spend the night. The man bowed his head and worshipped the Lord and said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love, and his faithfulness toward my master. As for me, the Lord has led me in the way to the house of my master's kinsman. Then the young woman ran and told her mother's household about these things. And then uh, they, they uh, discussed back and forth. Uh, Going to pick up, a, pick up in uh, verse 50. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing has come from the Lord. We cannot speak to you, bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before you. Take her and go and... Let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. When Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed himself to the earth before the Lord. And all of God's people say, Amen. Well, we often hear in uh, political discourse uh, the phrase, the devil's in the details. And uh, if you watch uh, 
uh, the news or if you, if you uh, read uh, anything about politics. Every, every once in a while there'll be a, a very large bill that would be proposed. Um, what, what bills these days are not large, right? Uh, or there might be some kind of reform that's being proposed and uh, the length of it is so large that uh, it takes a whole staff of experts to wade through it for days, days, just to understand what it's trying uh, to say. In other words, uh, while the overall detail, uh, while the overall idea might be great, this bill, this reform, whatever it might be, uh, it's in the nitty gritty. Uh, it's in those little small details uh, where the action is. And so pundits talk about the devils in the details. You know, should we send billions of dollars to this country? Should we uh, fix these roads or whatever it might be? The devil's always in the details, right? Where's the money going and, and what's it for? And, and uh, what slush fund, what hidden monies are there as well? The devil's in the details. I mention that because uh, we know that the big picture of the Bible is that it's about Jesus. The Lord even himself once said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It's these, the scriptures that bear witness about me. The scriptures, the Old Testament in particular, bear witness about me. But how does that stand up when we get into the nitty-gritty details of seemingly non-theological, non-prophetical, non-Christological, we might say, passages like Genesis chapter 24? So the big idea, Jesus Christ is the theme of the Bible, but yet, how do all the details actually say that? And so we've got to look to the text, these details of the stories that we've been reading through and and, and seek to find the Lord Jesus Christ here, veiled behind the shadows uh, of the Old Testament. In our story this morning, then, uh, this detail, Genesis chapter 24, it's about Abraham's finding a wife for his son Isaac. As the Proverbs tell us, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. And uh, all the husbands say amen to that, right? So, he who finds a wife finds a good thing, as the Proverbs say. Um, we meditate upon this portion of God's word today. Uh, let's meditate upon the faith, first of all, the faith of Abraham. We see his faith once again here. Uh, secondly, the, 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 the finding of this wife, Rebecca, of the servant, Abraham's servant. Uh, but most especially, uh, when we read of Abraham's faith and the servant's finding, we really are seeing here, uh, as even the text describes for us in these small little ways, the faithfulness of the Lord. The faithfulness of the Lord. He leads the servant by his invisible hand, his providence to Rebecca. Ultimately, he keeps that promise that he said, I will bless you and all the nations shall be blessed in Abraham. He continues that line of the seed of the woman, the line of Abraham, now the line of Isaac, who, is, uh, who are the line of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if this story doesn't exist, there's no Jesus. Humanly speaking, if the servant doesn't find Rebecca, you and I aren't here today. You realize that, right? If we just tore out, you know, it's only one little story. I mean, it's 67 verses, pretty long, but uh, if we just tore this section out, and, you know, it's kind of irrelevant, doesn't really say much about, uh, much about anything, you know, should we, should we, does it really give us advice here for how to, how to find a wife and so forth? Eh, maybe it's not that, not, not that relevant for us. So, you know, but, but if, if we got rid of this story, where would Jesus be? Humanly speaking, would he have been born? And if he wasn't born, you and I wouldn't believe in him and we wouldn't be here this morning. So the devil's in the details. All these stories somehow point us and they lead us and just one little, one story in a great, great story uh, that lead us to Jesus Christ. And that's the big thing that we will end up singing this morning. But notice, first of all, the faith of Father Abraham. Uh, uh, in the ancient world, uh, it was the father's job, it was dad's job to, to initiate a marriage process. Uh, but the problem of the story is stated up front. It's a, good, uh, it's a good narrative that gives us sort of a tension, gives us kind of a conflict at the beginning. Uh, what's the problem with Abraham here? He's old, right? He's old. And as you can see there, he's, he says to the servant, you know, whatever you do, 
First of all, don't take a wife for my son from these people, the Canaanites. And secondly, don't take my son back there, right? There's not a lot of good people surrounding us, uh, but it's his job to find a wife, but the problem is that he's old. Is he really going to travel all the way back to his home, uh, to his homeland, his father's house, and so forth, to find uh, a wife or a son? No. So he has to, he has to appoint, uh, to commission on his behalf, this, this eldest servant, as verse 2 describes him, to go and, and search out and, Lord willing, find the wife for Abraham. Notice the, the very serious, solemn nature of the task that Abraham calls his servant uh, to accomplish. He says in verse 2 that uh, he is to put his hand under his thigh. That's that's a euphemism. That's a nice way of saying uh, that he puts his hand underneath the reproductive organ of Abraham uh, as an oath that the line is going to continue. It has to. God has said it must. And so it's this very solemn way of saying the line, right, the seed, a son, uh, is going to continue, and so they swear. And so the servant swears this oath that he won't take a wife for Isaac from the Canaanites, but from Abraham's family line. But that's another problem. Why is that problematic? Why is that strange? Why, why is that a difficulty as well in the story? That Abraham tells the servant, go back to my father's house and find a wife there not amongst the Canaanites and don't even take him back there right implying there's a lot of bad stuff going on so why would he say though go then to my father's house was Abraham and his whole household and his whole family line I mean were they were they all worshipers of the Lord what did we learn way back when in the book of Joshua what what was Abraham's family like they worshiped idols. They worshiped idols. So it, it seems strange then that Abraham is, says, go back to my former culture, my former uh, people, my father's house and so forth, uh, to these, these, these unbelieving uh, idol worshipers who are just as unbelieving as the Canaanites that are living around him. But put it into the bigger picture. Notice, uh, remember uh, Noah's three sons. Noah's three sons. Shem. Ham, Japheth. It's the line of Shem that brings us Abraham. In other words, there, there's more of a chance. There's not a great chance, but there's more of a chance that amongst the Shemites, the line of Shem, there would be someone a little more God-fearing from the family of Nahor than from the Canaanites. There's a better chance. Right? There's a better chance. You see, Abraham is a, a paradigm for the Israelites later on in the book of Deuteronomy and, and also for us as Christians. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I believe it is, that we are not to be unequally yoked. He tells the, uh, the Israelites are told that by Moses uh, as well. Uh, there's, there's more a chance of finding uh, a, a godly person uh, in the Father's house than there is uh, amongst sort of the world, if you will. There's more a chance of finding a, a godly person uh, amongst professing believers than there is amongst professing non-believers, right? That's sort of a logical uh, 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 truism. So he sends the servant there. Uh, the servant raises several questions, most important of which is, what, well, what happens if the woman won't come back? Right? Kind of a problem, kind of a big deal. I can't be really married uh, by distance. Um, so we see the faith of Abraham, though. So resolute, verse number 7. Uh, think about the first words that we read uh, in chapter 15, Abraham's first recorded words in chapter 15, and how they now compare to these words, his last recorded words here in chapter uh, 24. In chapter 15, the first recorded words of of, of Abraham in terms of him speaking uh, with the Lord, uh, God had promised to be, the Lord had promised to be Abraham's reward. I'm your shield, I'm your reward. Oh Lord God, Abraham, uh, Abram cried out, what will you give me for I continue childless? Oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess the land? And we saw back then, we saw 
uh, uh, some tinge of doubt in, Father's Abra- uh, in Father Abraham's trusting the Lord's promise, whether or not he would actually uh, be good on that promise. And we saw his struggles and his earthly pilgrimage. But yet these latter words here in chapter 24, we see him very firm in faith. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred and who spoke to me and swore to me, quote, to your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, the servant, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. Abraham's faith here. It's more than just an example to us of what faith looks like. It's a promise for us. The promise is that through all the ups and all the downs of life, all the ups and all the downs of our faith, all the ups and all the downs of the the Christian life, like a pilgrim in the wilderness, like Father Abraham, God promises to progressively more and more strengthen our faith throughout our lives, So that although we believe like Father Abraham and although we have many doubts, we come to believe more. Uh, We come to believe with a much more firm confidence and resoluteness to our faith. One of the songs that we sing says it like this, When I fear, when I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path. For my love is often cold. He must hold me fast. That's what the Lord promises here. Abraham has faith and he believes, but it's it's God who's holding him. And he's helping him to hold on to the Lord. That's what what we got to realize about faith, right? We say it's a gift and that's sort of a a thing that we use when we talk about uh, uh, salvation. We argue with our Arminian friends and our and our, and our non-reformed friends, you know, faith's a gift, and they say, no, it's not, and we say, yes, it is, and they say, no, it's not. And it's sort of a, it's an academic thing, it's a mental thing, it's a thing we use to banter back and forth. But if faith is a gift to us, that means that it's not just given to us once to receive the gospel and then God leaves us. If faith is a gift, and if we are to continually exercise faith, what does that mean? God is continuing to uphold our faith that he's once given to us to make that grip even stronger on him he's enabling us not just to believe in the lord once he's enabling us to hold on to him even as he holds on to us and so here's abraham here he is clinging to the promise that that the lord is going to send his angel before you you shall take a wife well what if she won't come back you shall take a wife He's holding on to the promise that in you all the nations shall be blessed. I will give this land to your offspring, God says. And so Abraham believes. Abraham believes. It's the same with us. We've got to grow in our faith. We're baptized, and our baptism teaches us to confess our sins, to acknowledge to God that we're sinful, to acknowledge that we trust that Jesus alone washes us from all those sins we read our catechism we read we confess our faith in church Uh, we 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 want to talk about what we've heard in the sermon we want to read the bible at home on our own we we need to pray uh, as believers god wants us to grow in our faith through all the ways and all the means that he gives to us faith is like a seed Children, it's like a seed. If you just have a seed and you leave it sitting out on your countertop at home or on the sidewalk out in front of the house, what's going to happen to that seed? Nothing, right? It's just going to die. It's just going to be fruitless, purposeless. But when we hear the words, when we read our catechism questions, the Lord causes that little seed to sprout up in our hearts. And as we listen to him some more, as we read some uh, of the Bible, we read some articles maybe, we listen to some podcasts, we, we read some big theology books, maybe as we get a little bit older, our faith begins to grow. That, that little seed begins to flower and it becomes mature 
Uh, and eventually, we confess our faith. We profess the Lord's name, not just amongst Christians, but the world. And we come to receive from the Lord's very hand uh, the very body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, in the supper of the Lord. We need to grow in our faith, and we see that with Abraham here, growing in his faith, firm, confident, convinced. Now notice the servant goes out to find, that's really the whole rest of the story, goes out to find uh, this wife. And our, our story also reveals this finding of the servants. Uh, really, it's his recognizing that the Lord has led him. And the Lord has brought to him this woman. That's why he falls face down and he worships the Lord. He prays to God that he's kept his faithfulness. God has been faithful. God has been faithful. And so this, the text jumps from the servant swearing that oath in verse 9 and his arrival in Mesopotamia, the city of Nahor, in verse number 10. And he comes to a well of water just outside the city where the women would come every, every evening when it was cooler uh, to draw water for the next day for their animals, uh, for their household, for, uh, for, for washing, for, for cooking, uh, for, for watering perhaps if they had any, uh, uh, any gardens or any, any plants or any food that needed to be watered. And so the servant there offers this prayer and his prayer is to be faithful to his promise to Father Abraham. And it's also a prayer, notice, very interesting, a prayer for a certain type of woman to be found. Now, in this, we, we see what we call, we call it the providence of God. It's sort of like a hidden hand. When people are led in the Bible and they go places and, and things happen, and even if God isn't mentioned, and for example, in this story, does God ever speak in the story? No. But he's just as present in this story as he is in the stories where he speaks. We call that his providence, his hidden hand. He, he leads, an invisible hand. He leads and, and guides his people to where he wants and where they need to be uh, in such a way that uh, although they're doing all these things, he's praying, he's stopping at a well, he's praying for a certain kind of a person, uh, he's promised to Abraham. He's done a lot of stuff, but yet it's God. Yet it's God who's doing the work here. There's a great Jewish commentator in the Old Testament, Nahum Sarna, uh, and he says it like this, Be it coincidental or otherwise, one cannot fail to be impressed by the fact that uh, it is this man who is the first person of whom it is expressly recorded in the Bible that he prayed for personal divine guidance at a critical moment of his life. So the first time in the Bible read of someone asking God for, 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 for guidance to lead to bring me to a place that I need to be and to grant me this particular situation to come about, this is the first person. And it's, as Sarna says, whether it's a coincidence, right, in human speak, uh, or, or it's providence, right? The point is that, yes, it is the Lord. It is the Lord. He, he asks for personal guidance at this very critical junction. Abraham's going to die soon. His son is not yet married. If a son's not married, he can't have sons. If he can't have sons, then the promise fails. And so this man asks for guidance. Sarna goes on to say this. We know that he, the servant, did not ask. Notice this. He doesn't ask for a miraculous intervention of God to designate the future bride of Isaac. He doesn't write in the sky. Okay. Uh, he doesn't. Uh, th there's not a voice out of heaven. On the contrary, he, the servant, the servant himself decided upon the criteria of suitability and choice. He prayed, rather, that his exercise of discretion might be in accordance with God's will. It would be by the quality of this woman, this faceless woman, this nameless woman, that Abraham's servant would know that this was the right woman to marry Isaac. It was not from a sign from heaven. It was not in a miraculous vision. It was not in a word that spoke, that God spoke. God doesn't come in those three personages uh, like he did to the tent of Father Abraham. No. God's not even 
God is praying to, but God doesn't even speak in the story. He doesn't even arrive in the story. The servant comes up with, with, with certain qualities, characteristics, and he prays, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The only thing the servant sets out as criteria is that the woman be considerate of a stranger. She's generous in giving her water. A servant in helping a stranger like him. And a hospitable person. So she has certain qualities, certain characteristics that, that he's looking for. Her beauty and her availability, as this word, batula, no man, whom no man had known. It means that she was of marriageable age. These are just things that are mentioned as kind of as bonuses, if you will. What she looked like in her past, and her availability, as it were, they're just mentioned sort of as little bonuses. In other words, in other words, for those of us who are unmarried, here's what God wants you to know from this little story. Interesting little story, isn't it? There's two criteria that God gives to us in his word for marriage. She must, she or he must be same beliefs, right? Same beliefs, right? We're not un unequally yoked. We're believers. And we don't violate the seventh commandments. We don't commit adultery, right? We're not involved in sexual immorality. Everything else, everything else, God allows you freedom within the way he's made you to choose whether he or she is tall or short, blonde, black hair, it's indifferent. That's up to you to decide. He prays for these certain qualities and characteristics. And by the way, she just happened to be a very beautiful woman. And by the way, she just happened uh, to be available. Uh, she had not known a man. Uh, and there, there you go, right? There you go. And so he sees that as the very hand of God. And so uh, behold Rebecca, verse 15, behold Rebecca. And she does precisely what the servant prayed for. The man gazed, verse 21. He gazes at her in silence, right? He's in awe, right? We oftentimes do this. We set up a scenario, we pray, and then all of a sudden it happens, and we can't even explain it. He gazes at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. It was almost like he said, you know, here's the criteria. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to kind of set it up where it's going to be doomed to fail. He said, I can't bring Isaac here anyway, and if, if, if I can't find a woman to do this, I get to come back and be free to the oath. He kind of sets it up for failure, doesn't he? But God fulfills it. But God fulfills it. He recognizes the hidden hand of God. He gives Rebecca these various gifts of gold, these rings and so forth. Seeks out her father, verse 22, 23. And all that causes him to worship in humble acknowledgement the Lord's goodness and grace. And note well this phrase in his prayer, verse 27. As for me, the Lord has led me. As for me, the Lord has led me. He traveled. He came up with a certain characteristics. He prayed the prayer, but yet it was the Lord who led me. He also repeats this in speaking to Rebecca's brother Laban and, and her father in verse 48, which I didn't read, but uh, later in Exodus, this very same Hebrew word is used for the Lord's leading the Israelites. Here's the fatherly providence, the hidden hand of our great God. I found an old hymn, and uh, it's uh, a hymn that, that, that puts these words of uh, Genesis chapter 24 to music. Uh, it's a hymn from the 1700s, and it says like this. It says, when Abraham's servant to procure a wife for Isaac went, he met Rebecca, told his wish, her parents gave consent. Yet for ten days they urged the man his journey to delay. Hinder me not, he quick replied, since God hath crowned my way. The Lord has led me. The Lord has led me. And their hesitation and so forth, their little obstacles, they're not going to get in the way. The Lord, the Lord has led me. 
You see, it's a great example to us of, of the need to trust in the, the providence of God, that, that hidden hand of God. We need to know that God's almighty and ever-present power, whereby, as it were, by his very hand, he upholds the heavens and the earth and all creatures. We need to know that that hand guides and governs us, leads us, and so that nothing comes to us by chance in this life, but all things come to us by God's fatherly hand. Sometimes his hand has to push us to do things, other times he has to pull us to do things, but we can be assured of this, that all the while God's hand is under us, holding us, and nothing can snatch us out of that hand. In all circumstances of life, it's God who's with us. Do you trust that today? Do you trust God that he's leading and guiding you no matter the ups and the downs today? That it's God who, uh, who is with you. We need to trust this before it's too late for us. Trust the providence of God. When the results of the fall are, are all around us, right? The sin of Adam are all around us. Whether the death of a loved one, the loss of, uh, of a stability in life, the brokenness of our relationships. It's too late when that stuff happens. To then go scurrying around your, uh, your little bookshelf at home. I know that Pastor Danny gave me a copy of the Hatterick Catechism at some point. And then you find it there. It's got a lot of dust on it. You haven't read it yet, right? It's too late. What question was that one? Again, I forget that one. By the way, it's question 27, okay? You need to hide those things in your heart now. God's providence, his almighty power, his ever-present power. Nothing, nothing comes to me by chance in this life. All things by his providence, right? The Lord, the servant says, the Lord has led me. So we have, we have Abraham's faith, right? You're going to go there, you're going to get a wife. What if she won't come? What if this? What if that? The Lord has said. The servant goes, the servant goes, and he makes up these little criteria. He prays these things out to God, and he sits there at the well, and he sees it all coming true. It's the Lord who's led. She becomes the wife. Uh, as the story ends there, verse 67, which I didn't read yet, but uh, says, And she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. We're taught there the faithfulness of the Lord. And again, I, I just want to reiterate this. I mentioned it a couple times already, but uh, how many times does God speak in chapter, chapter 24? Zero, Zero right? God never speaks in the chapter. How many times does God appear in the chapter? How many times, brothers and sisters? None, right? I know I didn't read the whole chapter, but if you were to read it on your own, trust me, uh, when I tell you this, God does, uh, never appears, right, in this story. Uh, how many miracles are in this story? How many signs are in this story? None, right? None. We don't have the smoking fire and, and so forth that God appeared as with Abraham. We don't have the men at the, t at the tent. We don't have the voice of God and so forth. We don't have fire out of heaven. It's a very ordinary story. It's a very ordinary story. But yet God's the main actor. God's the main actor. It's his hand, his, his, his providence, right? His hidden hand that's leading the story. All to fulfill his own faithfulness, to be, to be faithful to his own promise. He's mentioned, God is mentioned 17 times in the story. Although he doesn't appear, he doesn't speak, he's mentioned 17 times in the story. Abraham and his servant knew that God was, was with them. Now, in verses 12, look at verse 12, uh, verse 14, verse 26. I'll just mention those three verses. 12, 14, 26. The servant mentions there three times the, quote, steadfast love, unquote, of the Lord. The steadfast love of the Lord. Uh, this is that, that Hebrew term that I've mentioned before, uh, chesed, that uh, it's a very special word in the Old Testament. It, it speaks of the fact that the Lord is loyal uh, and that he's faithful to the covenant promises that he's made. In other words, he never fails. God never fails. And as those who had been taken into the God's covenant of grace so graciously by the Lord, Abraham and Sarah and you know, Isaac and Rebekah, and us too, his chesed, his steadfast love, his faithfulness, his loyalty, uh, his dependency, 
His unfailingness is all that we have in this life. That's what we need to rely on, that God, that God is faithful. It's his faithfulness to his own promise way back when to Father Abraham that led Rebecca, it led her to that well that night at that particular time when the servant just happened to be there at that moment, at that time, at that place. It's God's faithfulness that fulfilled the promise to Abraham. Uh, and again, it's, what, it, it's God's faithfulness that is what the Israelites could rely on later on. Don't forget, this is written by Moses after the Exodus, and they can look back and see the very things that they've experienced, their forefather, foremother experienced too. And later on, when the Israelites would be exiled again, uh, uh, in a land that was not their own, before they came back to the promised land, we read these words in Isaiah 54. The Lord was showing his faithfulness to them all throughout human history, all throughout their history, that they could rely on him even when they were disloyal. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. You see, my friends, brothers and sisters, God's hidden hand orchestrated this little detail story, Genesis chapter 24. The devil's in the details, we might say, and better yet, God is in the details here. It's God's hidden hand that orchestrates not just this story, but the whole of human history. Not just this particular story and not just our own individual, personal story. It's the wholeness of human history that God is in control. And his hidden hand made these little details possible, again, for the great, grand, and glorious gospel purpose that Jesus, that Jesus would be born. If Rebecca hadn't walked out to that well, if the servant hadn't traveled all the way from the promised land all the way to Mesopotamia, if she hadn't offered him water and gone and got more water for his animals, and all the little details of the story, if all those things didn't happen at the right time, at the right moment, the right place, with the right people, you and I wouldn't be saved today. We would be lost in our sins. The world would still be covered in gross darkness. And we would perish. We'd have nothing. We'd have nothing. But God. Right? But God. But God is the one who orchestrated this wonderful story with his hidden hand. And so recognize today. Recognize. God's great love for you, sinner. Recognize in this story God's great love for you, sinner that he orchestrated this particular marriage so that you would be saved. Recognize that today. Recognize that. And as you do, repent of your sins. God, I'm a sinner. Have mercy upon me. There's that line in that, in that prayer we said this morning that we are vile earth. Right? We're, we're dust. Vile earth. Recognize God's great love and repent. God, I am sorry for sinning against your great love for me. My many, many, many sins. And receive, receive God's gracious Son, Jesus, the one that is the outcome of the story. Receive him today. Receive him to forgive you of all of your sins. Receive him to change you from the inside out. Receive him as the one who is the same Lord who guides and who leads your life as well, who puts you in the path towards glory. Recognize God's great love. Repent of your sins. Receive the greater Son, Jesus, today. Let's pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that we can look to you in all the ups and downs, even all the mundaneness of this life. We can see your hidden hand. Uh, and Lord, whether uh, we do not know you yet today, whether we have fallen away from you. Uh, Lord, whether we trust you with all of our hearts, we, we, we confess that uh, there's so much of our lives that are 
Uh, they're, out of, they're out of our control. Uh, they're out of our, it's out of our hands. Uh, it can be chaotic. It can be, uh, uh, it can be meaningless, even at times it feels. But we know that you are uh, the Lord who's made all things. You are the Lord of all history. And you're so good and you're so kind and so loving that you would, that you would save sinners like us. And that you did all these things and these stories uh, with us in mind. We praise you, we thank you, and we ask, Lord, that you would help our faith today uh, to be firm and strong, to grow. And uh, even as we come to the Lord's, ty- uh, the, the, the Lord's table, the Lord's Supper, uh, that this would be a means uh, of encouragement to us to continue on, and to trust you, and to lead us, Lord, where you want us to go, and to lead even others to us that you want us to find. And we ask this all in Jesus' name, and all of God's people say, Amen.